just wanted to ask him to go with you because I wasn't able to be here last week, so I tried watching the video. And um, I couldn't hear any of the questions. Unfortunately, Acharya sort of gave you an idea what the question was, even though she didn't repeat them. None of the questions were loud enough. Just thought I'd let you know that. Okay. Thank and, you. Um, about five to ten minutes into it. Yes, Holly King tried to call. Is that And then Sally tried King? to enter into Is the conversation. Wow. Oh, I was like, I kept hearing her the background noise yeah. where she was. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, there's okay. nothing I can do. About no, that. there wasn't anything about that. Um, can okay, do that. Yeah. So that's somebody we actually know. She's a shaman. She's part of her class, yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. So can she write? Yeah. So there are people watching this on the Yeah, but something happened to her mm -hmm. entry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> okay, let's do a little bit of meditation. So we have some new people tonight. So welcome. 
So let's begin by arriving in the body. Sorry. Really grounding yourself with contact on the earth and spending a few minutes to do a kind of body scan where you just remember your posture. I'm not going to reintroduce the posture. But feel into your body completely. and arrive. You notice anything in your body, just gently touch that with your awareness without accepting or rejecting. Just touch, feel the atmosphere in the body. and let go with the breath. The breath is the object of meditation. So spend a few moments feeling into the breath, the natural rhythm of the breath. <coughs> and specifically the out breath. And the reservoir of space that we contact at the end of the breath. at the end of the out breath. Touch that. And let go with the in breath. So ride the breath into the room. Touch the space. and let go further with the next breath. So meditation is synchronizing our body, breath, and mind. So take a few moments to feel into the atmosphere of your mind right now without accepting or rejecting, just feel. If you notice that you have a conversation going on or you're holding on to emotional content, whatever it is, don't push it away and don't invite it for tea. Just gently touch it. Just acknowledging it with your awareness, feeling the atmosphere and let go with the out breath into the present moment 
into the reservoir of space. You get lost in your thoughts and you notice that, don't judge it. Once you've noticed it, you're already meditating. Gently touch it by feeling into the atmosphere of your mind. And then let go on the out breath into the present moment, into the openness of not one, not two.
So let's take a moment just to touch into the incredible opportunity and responsibility we have in this moment just by being able to listen to the Dharma in contrast to many people in the world who have, who do not have that opportunity, who are in vulnerable situations. Let's rouse our heart potency. Anything come up this week? that opens your heart, you can just, a couple people say a couple things in the bigger news or 
in your lives? Transgender teenagers. So open to transgender teenagers. Other news events or personal events. Another is considering loss of uh, memory and also just as tremendous statement of appreciation. So for your mother, Gilda's mother's loss and all the people who share that right now. Anybody else? Journey of Cancer. Journey of Cancer and all the people who are making that journey right now. Maybe some of us in the room. You just touch into the potency of that. And then we bow to our shared humanness. Great. So who came in new tonight? <laughs> you were here the first time. Yes. Oh, hi. So a few people dropped in. Welcome. Welcome. Anyone else? Did I miss them? Okay. Very welcome. And there are recordings of the first few talks if you want to join in, if you're inspired. Uh -huh. So how's the reading going? What's coming up? Are you reading or is your life like mine? <laughs> <laughs> Any comments on the readings? And let's please use the microphone. Yeah, those of you who are in the back, great Tyler. Thanks for coming up. I don't know, I think so. Where is the microphone? Oh, okay. Anybody have any comments? I couldn't put down. I couldn't put down the. Uh, I couldn't put down reading the bios. Uh -huh. And was horrified and fascinated and, <laughs> and disturbed by how much of it I recognized. In the Padma, in particularly, in the red, yeah. Interesting because we are humans, right? <laughs> On the one hand, good. Oh no, sorry, not not the problem. I was, oh. I read the hungry ghost, the hell, and the animal today. Okay, and <laughs> didn't want to recognize as much of it as I did. It's like reading a diagnostic manual. You see yourself in yeah. every diagnosis. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the way Trump Roche talks about it, makes it so familiar. <laughs> I feel the same way about the artists. Um, and I like the, the five Buddha families a whole lot better. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, in each one, there's the positive manifestation and the negative manifestation. Ah. And so I can make myself feel good by the manifestations. Right. But do you have some sense of why we're studying the, the realms? Mm. I think now we do. Um, what could you just bravely attempt to articulate that? <laughs> Um, well, as we identify aspects of ourselves while reading, hearing you talk about them, um, I think we, we get insight into our own position, our various positions that we take in. And just that we are getting increasing our awareness of ourselves as we move through the different realms, and maybe in one day, we 
For sure. Very good. And this whole notion of from nowhere else comes the wisdom. From that exaggerated, energetic, frozen space, from nowhere else comes the wisdom. I keep emphasizing that inseparability of wisdom and confusion. It's a very radical view. We didn't learn it in high school. <laughs> yeah. I'll say something. Um, I've been working all week with the, I just observed you guys doing it, but I've done it before, the exercise where you, you're not pushing away, but you're not grasping. And I found that, that came up so many times in, um, particularly in the way that I try to solidify myself in situations. And then being able to notice that and noticing that as the gateway to cycling into another realm felt really like it, it allowed you to just slow the process down to bring mindfulness to things that normally just snatch your mind away. Beautiful. Great. That's very much the intention of what we're studying and with the intensity that we're studying it, that you might actually see it. And that's the homework at the end, too, of the realm cycling. Is you might see it. Great. Good. Yeah. Oh, Lisa. Thank you. <laughs> So, <coughs> this week I was able to do a form of it again. Mm -hmm. And that's where I was going to do it. Sometimes I will not. Uh, my experience is this week that I just did. Please. Please. Um, And it's first of all, um, in our last week's class, um, I started a new job on Wednesday. And it um, like, was very interesting to see the results. And then, so I, I was thinking about how to do those kind of qualities. And I noticed how. I said, I did seem to be going back and forth between like a part of the quality and a five and a party. It was really like, um, especially because for me, like, I, I'm so uncomfortable with this place. I'm starting a new job. It's so uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so just going back and forth between like, oh, oh, I can do this better. <laughs> or like, that my friends are or that my you know, I, I have this terrible affliction that I can't handle the situation. Um, and also, just thinking about fear and um, and underlying that, and I think that fear is like the defining characteristic of my life, and it is so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. And some people might have an anger problem, I think I have a fear problem because it seems so intense. But also, it's very difficult to work with because <coughs> when I stay with it, it seems to get worse. Hmm. Or I just get more entrenched. Are you thinking about it? Maybe. Mm -hmm. Because today, I um, Spontaneously like, started viewing myself like as a separate thing, and then I, so that when I had feelings, I could like I could imagine myself and in my mind I was had kind of been hospitalized by a dying in hospital bed, and it was like very very quiet, comfortable room, and I was there taking care of me. And, <laughs> Mm -hmm. and, um, that was kind of the only way that I could mm -hmm. nice. see what was happening. And then I could kind of see in my mind what was going on in my body. I could just focus on the sensations in my body. Mm -hmm. it was sweet. Um, so much. 
That's nice because it's a, a, a kind of a visualized my tree. Taking care of yourself. <coughs> so we all have fear, whether we're aware of it or not. Mm -hmm. Or we be realized. You're not, um, you're not unique with that fear, but you're very brave to talk about it. Thank you very much. Nice. Well, let's um, dive into the human realm. Um, Terry, do you have the, the reading? Could you read the... Um, the fifth and the sixth, yes. The lust and hangering. <laughs> <coughs> yeah, and let's use the microphone. Please. Seven robbers linked to me by karma from the past. The mental states of lust and hatred are but primal wisdom all perceived. Wanting to possess and greed for pleasure, from nowhere else comes clear perception. Watch this fresh, unchanging state for that is Amitabha. Do not be enthralled by clarity. Let bliss itself arrive. My mother is unbounded light. Great bliss beyond all fathoming is she. Unattached am I to tastes of joy or sorrow. Therefore, if you want my mother, I who am your mother will be so so those of you that are new to the class, we are taking this one song of realization from Yeshe Sojo <clears throat> and, and taking it apart and talking about what she's uh, transmitting there. So this happened to her um, when she was attacked on the road by seven robbers. And um, she sang this song of realization and they spontaneously transmuted into her disciples and their appearance changed and they became students of her. This, and in this song is a kind of pith instruction on how to transmute extreme emotions into wisdom. So just to give you a quick, <laughs> quick view. So this particular stanza, thank you for reading it, is about the human realm, which is considered the lowest of the higher realms. And there's three higher realms the God realm, the jealous God in the human realm, and then the lower realms, the hungry ghost, the animal, and the hell. So this particular realm is, even though it's the lowest of the higher realms, it's considered the most advantageous realm because it works with passion. And passion is that forward moving energy of desire, which we've been talking a lot about with Yeshe Sogyal and the whole notion of consort, particularly the secret consort aspect of that moment, that pregnant moment that happens for all of us if we catch it before anything anticipatory, where our life is moving forward. All of you like this example of a kiss, like we're about to have a kiss or be kissed, and there's this pregnancy, and we know that that's going to happen. Does that happen for everyone here? <laughs> and then that we could actually elongate and dive into that space, that forward moving open anticipatory space. So that's one of the reasons why this realm is most advantageous because there's so much uh, openness. And, um, rising mind. And another reason that this is an advantageous realm is because there's so much disappointment <laughs> at the same time, right? And disappointment actually gives rise to tremendous truth in space. So Trump Roche said that disappointment is the only thing that people do not fake. And that is really profound to put your mind around. That's a very genuine space. When we're disappointed, 
we're not putting on airs, we're not doing anything, we are just with it, right? So in the human realm, there is the, we basically have the extreme chaos of samsara. Samsara is the birth, old age, sickness and death, and all the ways in which we try to manage that. Birth, old age, sickness and death are the, just you get it whether you like it or not, just by being a human being. And then there's all the pain that we have by trying to deny it, manage it, change it, make it be something, birth, old age, sickness, and death, something else. That's basically all the suffering there is in the world. So that's samsara. And the other thing is that um, we have in the human realm, we have a lot of intelligence, we have a lot of choice. We actually can determine that anticipatory way, we can improve it, we can make it better, we can do, you know, we can accept and reject. We have a lot of fluidity with that. So there's this process of grasping on to something better, extreme grasping. That's the motion of the human mind. <clears throat> and at the same time, we can feel very lost and in this cloud of disappointment, and it's often um, infused with a lot of nostalgia because we have some idea of how it was when we were 27, it was perfect. <laughs> I don't, it wasn't perfect for me at 27, but you know how it used to be, right? In our minds, perfect example of this is um, my um, husband, he, he really, he, he's from Slovenia and he, um, he really, uh, really dislikes it when um, old Sangha members come to our house, uh, people that were around in the 70s. He always really says it's who fucked who in 1972. <laughs> because he says that we sit around and we romanticize and go on and on about what happened and what, who was there and what all happened. It was the perfect moment. Sure, many of you have heard older students do this, right? Very nauseous. The truth is, um, we're always trying to create a past that's very pleasurable. It was the so-called golden age of Trung Rinpoche. Problem is, when we were all there, we all missed it <laughs> because we wanted it to be another now, right? So that's what the human realm does. It reconstructs reality in such a way that it's constantly trying to recreate itself into this kind of perfection right? that most of us missed while it was happening to begin with. It's so ridiculous. <clears throat> so this extreme dualistic split is operative. Something out there is better, it's going to be better. In the future, it's going to be much better, for sure. <clears throat> and there's something that we can obtain that's perfect. We can get the best food, or we can find the best restaurant, or the best coffee, or what? What's your best? Best wine? What? What are you obsessed with? Best experience. The best experience, the best vacation, the best city, the best house. The best cup of tea. The best cup of tea. <laughs> right? So there's that constant projection. So this extreme dualistic split we want it, you know, we're just connoisseurs of phenomena. Right, we want it to be better. And at the same time, there's a critique going on, a constant critique of nobody's doing it right. Right? <laughs> Everybody is really doing it. Nobody's good enough. We really have a huge commentary on other being imperfect. Not well, we're trying to achieve ideal perfection. This is this really um, kind of rat race we get caught in. So there's a lot of selection, there's a lot of accepting, there's a lot of rejecting, and it turns out that in the human realm we experience a lot of fussiness, dissatisfied, 
So it's like um, if you've ever been someone, uh, you know, some of us have a reaction to this because it's very dramatic. So we've made a decision, we're not going to go there. It's too dramatic, it's too messy. But, um, but others of us understand this very well, this notion of falling in love. It's so wonderful, it's so perfect when you fall in love. It's just like the ideal person until 10 minutes later, it's not, right? It's this constant, like, you know, highs and being more addicted to the high until it's not, and then it's very disappointing. Or um, a perfect example of a, this is the Padma realm. Um, perfect example of a Padma food story is Jacqueline Kennedy, Arnassus. You know, did you ever hear <clears throat> when she ate a meal? First of all, she was about a size four all her life. But when she ate a meal, she would order these extreme meals and then she would eat one bite of every dish and chew it thoroughly and that was it. She would not have more than one bite. That is an extremely Padma way of um, being perfect and um, controlling and accepting and rejecting all in one. So the extreme state of the human realm is um, actually gets very hallucinatory. There's so much projection on space that the, a certain kind of traffic jam begins to happen. It's, it's the, the element is fire, so it gets very scattered. Discursiveness begins to um, crash into itself in our in inside our minds. We get very 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 busy. There's planning going on. It's going to be better, and we get ourselves going on airplanes and all kinds of stuff, and we're just cuckoo as a result of it. I really experienced it this week because I was on, myself on two planes, three three trips this week. So. Nuts, you know, it's just like you know, a way of life, and it's a kind of drama for existence. I thought that the dramas were playing with me, <clears throat> teaching me my Padma nature. <laughs> so they talk about it, she talks about it as seven robbers linked to me. By karma from the past, the mental states of lust and hankering. So this is this grasping, and it's different. Um, the Padma family intensifies into the Ratna family. So the passion realm intensifies into the hungry ghost realm. Hungry ghost is a more extreme version. But there's this subtle difference between this passion versus hunger, desire versus hunger. It's a wanting to possess. The hunger is just going, you know, straight for anything it can get its teeth on. But the passion is wanting to possess and greed for pleasure, as she puts it. And that's an interesting thing because the minute that we actually get it, whatever it is that we're after, the typical thing is that we slam the door, we're not interested in it anymore, we're on to the next thing. Mm -hmm. We're, we're yeah. developing art of going for the thing. Right. The, you know, there's like, there's a creating an artistry around. Um, well, I was just going to <laughs> I was going to say that um, because you get smart to knowing the, <clears throat> the taste of getting the thing and it's not quite, doesn't last for very long, then the pod energy goes into making an art of going after the thing. That's right. It's much more about going after. It's the process of going after. It's a perfection of the art of going after. It's like shopping. It's like shopping endlessly. 
I have a lot of apps on my phone that when I get bored in meetings, I'm just looking at dresses, endless dresses. You know, <laughs> <laughs> just like, you know it's, it's silly, but very entertaining. <laughs> So let's use this because of the online folks. Um, it, it intensifies into poverty and pride you can't have, or you've got it, it's all dri driven from poverty. That's going into the rotten around. But it's much more the game of accepting and rejecting in the Padma and the human realm. It has a lot of art to it. What Lisa was saying, it's got a lot of art. You become completely phenomenally um, um, refined at putting on the perfect dinner party or you know uh, Padma is um, like going to the Zuni whereas Ratna is like your grandmother's Thanksgiving you know with all the family you know, it's just, it's much more refined in the Padma realm. It has much more intelligence and much more accepting and rejecting. I had a, a roommate in college. I went to a woman's college, a finishing school that almost finished me. And um, I had a roommate in college and she was from uh, Beverly Hills and she really grew up in this um, uh, family where everybody in the family had had a one of these um, operations where they had, um, they were just all obsessed with being perfectly thin. And so she, she was not a thin girl, she was a very big girl. And her mother would call her every day and ask her exactly what she'd eaten and was on her like that. And, and she didn't quite fit in. I once visited her in um, Beverly Hills and I thought, Wow, this girl should be in an institute the way her family, they were all about visuals and perfection and what she wore. And she like had to go through a whole thing before she walked out the door and <clears throat> what she was wearing and what dogs she was taking and, and so on, and what car she was driving. And, and then um, her mother, her mother for Thanksgiving, they went to New York on a shopping trip and she came back and she had her jaws wired shut. <gasps> This was in the 70s, so. Her you know, no, her, the, the daughter, daughter had oh, her okay. jaws wired shut. And then her mother was calling her every day and making sure she was staying with the regime. But she wasn't. She was going out and she was drinking milkshakes and oh. doing all kinds of things. And then her secret Santa ended up giving her um, chocolate chip cookies for Christmas. <laughs> and I came home one night and she was unwiring these things mm -hmm. in, at my makeup mirror. It was, and I ended up having to take her to the hospital because you know you can't undo that kind of stuff, right? And it's a real tragic story, but anyway, I loved her very much. But she was an example of that someone who kind of grew up in this incredible karma reality, and she was extremely rotten as a result, and tragic almost. So. <laughs> So the lines say of all this, uh, you know, everybody can touch this, right? This energy of accepting and rejecting. We all know it in some way, right? Yeshe Sogil says, from nowhere else comes clear perception. From nowhere else comes clear perception. That's so astounding. But that kind of intelligence is what gives birth to discriminating awareness, wisdom, what we call caution, this better known, this capacity to see. The fact that we can sit here and talk about this and see ourselves in the midst of the extreme energy is prashna itself. Often. We see ourselves, you said that you got, you said you couldn't put down the um, book because you were seeing yourself, your prajna was operating, you might have been emphasizing the neurotic aspect, but the truth is you were seeing yourself from nowhere else comes clear perception. It's just what we do with that. It's important to really touch that. 
So prajna or discriminating awareness wisdom knows what to accept and what to reject. It knows that already without thinking it through. It's very clear whether we follow through on that is a whole other conversation, right? The ability to see without split and without grasping, to see things very clearly, seeing things as they are. In Buddha Dharma, we call that suchness, ta-ta-ta, suchness, things as they are, seeing things exactly as they are. And that is joined in discriminating awareness wisdom with the capacity to see simultaneously the sacred, which is the luminosity. <clears throat> this is the birth and the gift, the birthplace and the gift of the mother language, suchness and sacredness. This is the real fruition of accepting everything as it is with full capacity and clear perception. And we train in this in meditation every time we practice touch and go. So what does touch and go mean? Does anyone resonate with that? Do you use that in practice? Touch and go? Anyone? I mean, you know the slogan, Bill. Dr. Bill. Let's <laughs> 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 just keep it on because it seems to be a pain. It's working. Oh, it's working. Okay. What is that? It means to. Uh, have awareness to see what is and then move on. To not grasp it, grasp. right? And to not push it away either, right? Touch and go, perfect. Thank you. Anyone else elaborate? Yeah. Well, let me first address with that. It's no, there's no grasping there. It's much more feeling. Touch has this, like, gentle, if I were going to just feel the fabric of Lisa's sweater, I'm not grasping it. I'm just, I'm just touching it, right? It's very gentle. It's very perceptive. It's not thinking. It's not looking or grabbing. There's no grasping. It's extremely gentle and precise. So we do that with our mind. And then we return to the technique. Go ahead. You had a question? Yeah. Um, well, I have two questions. <laughs> 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 oh, talking about passion. This is um, I should know. So, um, personally, I have a lot of areas of interest in passion, like in professional and personal lives. And I do feel the struggle and do feel the ups and downs, the you know, excitement and disappointment. Yeah. Um, That's the good. Results, <laughs> yeah, results, it's good and bad and it's disappointment. So, with this. Touch and go and be mindful and aware and to apply them in those type of scenarios. Then I feel like I wouldn't have a strong interest to get into something. So let's be clear. That's really helpful. Your question because what we're t what I said is we train in this capacity not to accept and not to reject with touch and go in meditation practice. So meditation is a methodology where we learn to work with our mind, right? We're practicing and working with our mind. And it's a very precise technique. 
in life, I mean, touch and go could be that you notice that you, you're making a lot of mistakes while you're typing. And then you just kind of touch that you're in a speedy space. <coughs> and you bring yourself back to the present moment and you keep going. But passion in life, you gotta go for it. <laughs> or you'll never manifest your dreams. Something different. Well, it might be if you get too attached to it. If you have a passion in life and you have some big idea that it's going to be and it's going to be perfect and no matter what it is that your dream is, I can guarantee it's not going to come out like you thought it would. <laughs> yeah, good. Tyler, you wanted to say something, no? Um, Did you lose it? No, well, um, there's a teacher who also said it, but it's not Smith and Ryan. It's not <laughs> sniff and run. <laughs> that? That's awful. I don't like that. No. <laughs> I reject that. No. <laughs> we're, we're touching it, but, but we're uh, we're not going young in with it and diving so deep. No, we're not it. interpreting. Yeah. But we're not also touching it in a right way. Right. Right. That's true. We're examining, and then we're we're seeing it float down the river, and then we're letting it float down. The river. That's right. That's right. That's good. Good, good, good. Okay, let's keep going. She, she says, watch this fresh, unchanging state. For that is Amitabha. <clears throat> so unchanging state is this, it's a Vajrayana language, or always awake, always good, basically good, and always luminous. So we know that, right, from level one. We heard that at level one, if you've done level one. Did anyone not do level one? Oh, you're missing something. <laughs> yeah. So, but you've heard basic goodness before, right? Yeah. You can't be around your ball or too long. You hear about that. So that's just basically so. Um, watch this fresh, unchanging state. That is the pith instruction of touch. Watch it. This precision. For that is Amitabha. Amitabha, if we remember, was the Buddha who brought Padmasambhava into existence. A shooting of Vajra into the lotus and out of the lotus came Padmasambhava, which is why we're all sitting here, presumably. Amitabha is the Buddha of the human realm, Padma realm. The Buddha in the human realm carries a begging bowl, which is an amazing symbol. Mm -hmm. It's so funny for me because when my grandmother, who traveled all over the world, and she was a court reporter, and she found out I was a Buddhist. That was incredibly disappointing for her because she saw the Buddhists begging in China. And she said, how dare you uh, <laughs> defile this family? We, we, we're people of substance. We don't beg. It's just so astounding. She wrote me this like, long letter about this. That was her only reference to Buddhism. <laughs> So the Buddha has a begging bowl, and the begging bowl represents actually the mother of invention. The necessity is the mother of invention. That when, whatever it is, when we have a need of hunger, a human need of hunger, that we will magnetize what we need just through our humanness. That is the intelligence that arises out of desire and passion. This kind of answers your question about passion. <clears throat> it's, it's a good thing. So Amitabha is red, limitless compassion, selfless love. And his symbol is the lotus, which is this notion of purity that grows in the mud. 
the lotus always grows out of the mud. So it's this, this is the whole view of confusion and wisdom being inseparable. So when they say um, Yashe Sogyal is lady of the lotus born, that is representing the view of the inseparability of wisdom and confusion. So it says, excuse this little thing in my mouth. I'm so sorry. I'm uh, warding off a cough still. It's obnoxious. Um, <laughs> watch this fresh, unchanging state. Do not be enthralled by clarity. Let bliss itself arise. What does that mean to you? <laughs> 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 I'm just curious what comes up when you do that. Yeah, let's use the mic. Um. It's that I notice that I can get attached to clarity <laughs> and then want to hold on to it. Mm -hmm. And um, it's good. That's good. That's true. Others? You stick to it. Somehow. Right. You stick to clarity. Yeah. What does enthralled mean? Anyone know what enthralled? Do not. Do not be enthralled. Yeah. Ruled. Yeah. Ruled. It actually, its root means ruled. Which is interesting when you think about ruling our world. Do not be ruled by clarity. It's so amazing. <clears throat> In the summer, last summer, I did this um, two week, very strict vegetable juice fast. <laughs> and I got completely clear. And I'm always dealing with my um, sinuses and my bronchial area and I got completely mucus free and I've not been able to get back to that state all winter I mean I eventually had to eat food and whenever I eat food it all comes back right so it's a it's a vicious pod realm <laughs> trying to get back to that but you can't imagine how incredible it is when you have no mucus in your system how open your sense perceptions are and how much is going on when you're perceiving like that. That's not my normal way of perceiving, so I got very attached to it. And that's probably why I'm still you know, carrying this um, bronchial stuff. Yeah. So, do not be enthralled, do not be ruled by clarity. <laughs> Let bliss itself arise. So bliss, Sakyam says that bliss is the result of dewa virtue. I think that is such an incredibly pith instruction that when we, and so it's not about being good girls and boys, but virtue being um, being synchronized in our body, speech, and mind and acting in accordance with things as they are. That means telling the truth when we need to. It means relating to our lives properly, completely and properly. And just um, cultivating kindness and benefit of others is, is the um, conduct of virtue. When we do that, we begin to be selfless. And this, what I think begins to happen is this natural capacity to exchange self with other begins to occur. And that's where bliss arises. This is not separate from, from that. Compassion. The bliss of inseparability. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. <clears throat> the, the bliss of union and masculine and feminine principle. Definitely. So what does that mean? <laughs> within um, within oneself and um, or uh, not necessarily. Um, 
Um, acting when the moment arises, but waiting for the moment to arise, and then expressing fully without hesitation. Yeah, so this is kind of like we, we were talking about the first night. I think we were talking a lot about concert practice and this inseparability of not one, not two. Um, just to use that language doesn't, doesn't even fit together, but that we have the capacity as human be beings to feel fully the experience of other inseparably from ourselves. And when we're able to do that, that means we're in complete selflessness. And when we're completely selfless, the world is very blissful. But we fight that because it means that we've lost our territory, we're not sure who we are, we're getting secure, and we're beautiful, right? So it's not gonna happen by pushing a button. We have to have gradual methodologies to be able to taste that along the way so that we begin to loosen up. <clears throat> Shambhala is a worldwide famous at providing curriculum to take people along the way into experiences of bliss. By the way, <laughs> yes. <clears throat> oh, I thought it was Jerry. Okay. Okay. Jerry, yeah, it was you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, I just want to uh, also relate to our uh class in a bit of families? Uh, no, oh, yeah. But that's, that's, also, that's next week. But go ahead. Um, okay. I think so. Yeah, it's for next week. It's just that she sent it out in the same email. But go ahead. What, it's a great topic. What did you want to say? Oh, I want to say when I read those last two sentences, um, they must be strong, like query, and that was itself nice. Reminds me of um, the reading. Um, your choiceless awareness for Pujana. Prajna. Mm -hmm. Prajna. And Shunyata. Mm -hmm. Shunyata. Shunyata. Prajna is more like clarity, and Shunyata is um, emptiness. Emptiness or awareness without um, meditative experience and impact. It's awareness without grasping. Right. And then the first you described about um, self and connection with each other is more formless. Yeah. Formless, like me. But it, I, I personally I also experience that as well from time to time. Because I'm not, you know, that level enough to be completely groundless, but feel secure. Well, here's the thing um, that level. We all experience groundlessness many, 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 many thousands and billions of times a day. And we have very compensatory habits of covering that over and pulling ourselves back together and we're very married to those. Mm -hmm. And we would rather suffer from those than experience our natural openness and the groundlessness and truth of who we are. So it's not about being at any level. It's about being um, thoughtful and integrated in, in such a way with our mindfulness awareness that we can gradually begin to open to those moments that are happening ceaselessly and not freak out. And some people do it quickly and most of us, it takes a little while to practice. <laughs> well, actually, one thing that constantly keeps you and I was reading in the books and the materials that it really helps to apply the class meaning and being like the Lord. And I know it's not a prescription class, but 
No, but I want you to do that. That's why we're doing these experiential exercises at the end. So I really want you to take this. We can sit here and talk about Yeshe Soyo in the 8th century and all kinds of dharma. And none of that matters unless we bring it home to our experience right here, right now. So we're going to do an exercise in just a minute. Did you have a question about that? Okay, well, thank you for your question. Okay. So the, the last stanza says, um, or the last section, she says, my mother is unbounded light, great bliss beyond all fathoming is she. So we're talking about feminine principle being this openness, this unbound openness, suchness and sacredness. Unattached am I to taste of joy and sorrow. So there's that, <coughs> there's that joy again, which is always pointing at luminosity. <coughs> to give you another definition of luminosity, um, Trung Premache says, his, his definition is, there is nothing at all that is regarded as a dark corner or area of mystery. The whole thing is seen as open, brilliant. This is things as they are, luminosity. That is a definition of luminosity, suchness. So she says, great bliss beyond all fathoming is she. Unattached am I to states of joy or sorrow, back to this unbiased, not accepting or rejecting that we practiced last week. It's really good to see where we're attached where we can ride that. And then she says, therefore, if you want my mother, therefore, if you want this state of bliss, suchness, and sacredness, feminine principle, therefore, if you want my mother, I, who am your mother, will instruct you. I love that. I love that one. Because it's, what do you have? Bestow her. I will bestow her. That's right. Sorry. I will bestow her. It is only, it, and if I was reading, actually it was instructor, was um, another one, but anyway, I who am your mother will bestow her. So what she's saying here is only through our relationship to openness, suchness, and luminosity, things as they are, and this brilliance and joy, only through this feminine principle can we experience feminine principle. So I found this, um, somebody gave me this book. I'm a big Yoko Ono and John Lennon fanatic, and there's a show currently running. Anybody else like this, 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 these two? Yeah? Yeah. yeah. Okay. You like Yoko, okay, <laughs> only Yoko. Well, I like them both. Anyway, um, I found this is a little um, book that they published called Give, Give Peace a Chance, and there's lots of excerpts from their writing. So Yoko, in her essay, The Feminization of Society, 1971, she wrote, what we need now is the patience and the natural wisdom of a pregnant woman an awareness and acceptance of our natural resources or what is left of them. Let's not kid ourselves and think of ourselves as an old and matured civilization. We are both by no means mature, but that is all right, that is beautiful. Let's slow down and try to grow as organically and healthfully as a newborn infant. Okay. I thought that was apropos of uh, if you want my mother, I who am your mother will bestow her. So <clears throat> that's the Padma realm. And I'd like to do an experiential to make this personal if you're willing. Are you willing to do that before we have an, a conversation? So I have an elaborate um, little. Um, for some I want us to get into. Um, I want you to get into a for somewhere you're just sitting like a little group and if you'll just wait and see 
and you wait and see, we might need the numbers, okay? <clears throat> so you're gonna get in a foursome, and each person is going to have three minutes to talk, and the other three of you are just going to listen. And if that person chooses not to use their three minutes to talk, then you're just going to sit in silence and allow them to sit in silence. So everybody has the right. But the opportunity to talk about tonight and I, when we break into four cents, I want you to do this in silence because I want you to think deeply about your relationship to drama, your tolerance of acceptance or rejection of drama in your life. You know, where are you? Where do you sit on that continuum? Some of us manage away from drama a lot. We'd rather be monks than experience drama. Some of us thrive on drama. And also, if you're <laughs> willing, <coughs> talk about your relationship to desire, passion. If you dare, talk about unrequited passion. You know, unrequited love, things you didn't get. Don't overshare. Don't overthink it. Just let yourself play in the human realm. What is your relationship to this energy? What is true for you? Is everyone willing <coughs> to get in a foursome? Even if you choose to just sit quietly, that's okay. So I'm going to time you. Well, no, it's just desire, drama, where you sit with drama, what your relationship, I'll remind you. So please just form into little foursomes. If you're going to sit in chairs, sit in chairs of foursomes. And be a little group and spread out in little groups of four all over the shrine room. And don't start talking yet. Don't start talking <laughs> until it's the first person is stirring. <laughs> So let's see, there's a person. Yeah. Someone closed it for me. Is there a person going to be out? Don't go. Hey, hello. Those that are going way out there, please at least stay in the hallway because I want to guide this. Okay. Don't go too further than the hall. Do we have two more people that can't? Yes, we have, yeah, we have Lisa. Okay, so why don't you go over there, and there you go. You have two more here, right? Yeah. Okay, so Gilda. Yeah. Okay, so can that force them, uh, could Susan, your force them move that way towards the back of the shrine? No, it's, it's, it's going to end up being one person. Why? Because we have two more people here that we can add. So, Lisa, and could you join uh, Gilda and. Okay, does everybody have a group? I saw you so decide amongst the group who's going to be the first one. Who's going to go first? <laughs> who, who wants to get it over with? <laughs> you only have three minutes. Okay. Is there a group out in the other room? Yes, but we can hear you. Okay, okay, good. Okay, good. So um, let's just sit for a moment and just feel into what we want to say because after we do that and the first person starts talking, we could just forget about what we're going to say and put all of our attention without judgment. Without This is the same exercise we did last week without accepting or rejecting, only we're doing it with speech. So we're really holding who's ever talking in unconditional love. And we're not affirming what they say by nodding our head and 
asking them questions or underlining, and we're not rejecting what they're saying. And if you're doing that, just notice it in your own head and touch and go. So think about, here's the question again. Explore your continuum to drama. In your life, what do you do with drama? Talk about in relationship to desire, <coughs> to desire, or if you dare, you could talk about unrequited passion. If you want to go there, unrequited love. So I'm going to begin with a, a gong. And when I gong, you can bow. And then it's the first person who whoever volunteered to go first can begin talking. And then I will gong. And when I gong again, please stop talking. And then I'm going to guide you. Okay? So start with a bow. Yes. And now just one person talking. And the rest of you being silent. conversation and whether you were talking or listening, please close your eyes and come into yourself. And then just take a moment to feel the atmosphere of your mind. Gently touch it. And then 
sitting to the left of the person who spoke will be the next person who speaks. So when I ring the gong, you can bow fresh as a group. Okay? And then it's that person's turn to talk. Do your best to drop out of the conversation. Close your eyes. Spend a moment feeling into your body. Whether you were talking or listening, just notice the atmosphere of the energy. Gently touch. And go. So now the person to the left, I'm going in the direction of the family to the left. So we begin with a new bow. <laughs> Thank you. 
The last person. Don't want to be in the house. 
exercises like this if we fear that we might be violated. So do a final bow, bow and then thank your group.
and then come back to the circle. Let's see if we get that group out of that room. Could you hear me? Yeah, just great. <laughs> Good. And you had your privacy in there. <laughs> it's all about honor, kind of. <laughs> <clears throat> So let's have a discussion, a brief discussion about the mental states of lust and hankering from nowhere else comes clear perception. What's, what's up for people? Did I stir you all up with lots of fire and Padma energy? <laughs> yes, please. You just said the magic words because that sort of ties together what I feel I got out of therapy, which is that when passion erupts, it, it jolts me, and there is some clear seeing something. Yeah. She said when passion erupts, it jolts her, and then within that jolt is clear seeing. Mm -hmm. So you're sitting with a lot of clarity and stirred upness, right? <laughs> well, about that particular incident, I didn't say clear. Okay, beautiful. Do not be enthralled by clarity. <laughs> oh, definitely not. <laughs> Great. Thank you. Other comments or questions about what we're doing here? What, what this was tonight? Why did we do this? Why did I ask you to do this? Yeah, please, thank you. <laughs> well, it's a way of seeing our humanness mm -hmm. in the human realm. Mm -hmm. Well, the soul. Mm -hmm. We all have some relationship to that. Yeah. I found that when I was listening to the other people in my group, and as well as I was reflecting on what I had said myself, you know, it's really interesting to see the little ways where we try to manipulate our scenarios and the perfect cases that we're, we're beating ourselves up for not being enough, for not having enough, and maybe putting somebody else on a pedestal or the other hand. We're putting ourselves on the pedestal and turning something else down because we can see so clearly what we cannot see. Finding that space in between really can help. Oh, oh, Mike. That's so nice that you um, said that. One of the things about meditating with a group of people, if you ever submit yourself to that, you don't have to know anybody's name in the whole room. But you see everything about everybody <laughs> when you're practicing for even like three days or four days or five days. You begin to see the whole picture. It's all very obvious <laughs> in the silence. We're the last to see often. <laughs> Good. Thank you. Yeah, Lisa. Is it's interesting to notice in my life a pattern of like attempting to deal with disappointment by squashing passion. Like, like, like I, I, I thought I was really on to something kind of at certain points in my life by realizing, oh, like in order not to have this horrible disappointment that leaves me depressed for a while, I just need to not get so passionate about stuff. <laughs> and then 
And then after time, realizing that that's not the right thing because I'm just too much. I'm depriving myself. I'm depriving. Um, so I think that is what Usually that's the case, right? <laughs> yeah, I feel that. <clears throat> I thought there was nothing happening to it, but I guess not. Um, <laughs> I don't know how much a little talk about passion, except I think maybe passionate. I, I've always, because of a family situation, uh, disliked um, conflict, and um, uh, and I've had a lot of that with one of my closest friends. That there's deep love there, and that there's deep love in the family as well. And now, of course, the conflict of facing my mother's death and her illness, so we need to take care of her and all the rest of it, and um, the passions for. Uh, loving people, and uh, I'm just wondering, since I'm sort of waking up from being so drugged up with my medications, um, like today there was what you talked about in class, it was sort of like our dinner together with my mother, and so I thought, well, there wasn't as much going on because it wasn't the yelling and screaming and anger and all that that I recorded with another class, but then when I looked at it, at that point, there was a real love there. But then I'm wondering, I don't know, I have to think about it and feel it, whether I'm attaching to this newer uh, clarity that comes in to not being so drunk. Mm -hmm. Anyway, I don't know. It's a journey still. Well, I think, you know, that discernment all the time, I wouldn't worry about being attached or not. It's just discerning. The different states that we're having all the time, just discerning the variable uh, variabilities. Mm -hmm. Well, I was doing that this afternoon for dinner, but you know, my original thought when you started by talking about it is that well, there's been nothing going on, but then as you talk, the whole thing sort of unfolded about what you were talking about. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. I'm just thinking. good. Okay. So are people feeling vulnerable from this exercise? Yes. 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 Like you could go home and cry. <laughs> yeah. Suddenly the class is so quiet. I just wonder if they're... Well, vulnerable in a very welcoming way. Uh, not a scary vulnerable. I felt the melting of boundary. And uh, at times, tears come uh, because of the tenderness of our humanness and the commonality of it all. And just feeling compassion for myself and the women, you know, from our little group. And it was actually a very uh, welcome feeling because I'm. Uh, you precisely stop us in between each one. It was really uh, a nice moment of just really letting it go and just that's when those sensations were coming through for me. And that was very clear and it was kind of surprising and very gentle and I'm like, ah, but like, oh. like that. Very soft. Hearted, tender hearted thing that brought tears. And I've been in a, uh, a lot of turmoil in the past week uh, for a whole bunch of reasons. So, so this felt really wonderful. Quite wonderful. Yeah. So, thank you so much for your comment. I don't know, probably people are feeling this very differently. My experience is when we actually um, we just rove enough and talk about our experience and then we sit in silence and we have our own forum for three minutes. Usually we get vulnerable. We, we reveal. That's what these exercises do. 
in that exact capacity to be with the true state of our openness and vulnerability and our humanness is the opportunity. But if you're second guessing yourself and saying, oh, I wish I didn't say that and giving yourself a hard time, then you're not, that's just a reflex to cover over that shaky, basic goodness experience of our humanness. So please don't do that. Just touch and go if you're judging yourself about what you said or if you're judging anyone else and what they said. Just come back to that basic goodness of that shakiness if you can. So thank you for describing it so well. And um, that was the point. My experience is people are starving to death for that kind of contact, that kind of exchange with human beings. We all want that, but we're scared of it too. And then when we have it, we don't know what to do. So, yeah, please. I just uh, came back from spending a whole weekend with my book club. Six women in a car, driving to Ashland, Oregon. And I like to be by myself. And um, this little foursome, was, it was just so, such a relief. I, uh, I was like that a lot. And uh, it was just stressful. We had a wonderful time in a sense. Plays were incredible, beautiful weather. Uh, it was hard. So it was, it was just, uh, it's nice when someone's ringing a gong and making a video. So helpful. <laughs> I you wish know. that would happen too exactly. in my life. Me too. I would have liked to go in that car. Um, Never go. So much. <laughs> That's funny. Yeah. Please. <coughs> I had trouble with your instruction as the listener to um not and you said not to nod. <laughs> and yeah, that's very hard. hard. That's very hard. And then also, <laughs> I'm listening. I was watching myself. I was going to laugh, but then oh, that, 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 <laughs> oh gosh, I created a big watcher. Was, I'm sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I'm not, you know, it's very hard not to nod or to acknowledge, but often when we have those instructions, we notice how habitual yes. we are yes. and are, yes, yes, I'm with you. Yes. And we're affirming, affirming, affirming often and not listening. So there's some middle ground there. So thank you for noticing that. Yeah. <laughs> Good. Bill. <laughs> So I'm thinking about this feeling state of, of um, that I can feel that we're all here. And it's, it's a sadness of not having, of wanting and not having. Um, but it's not that desperate. I think of it as different from the hungry folks. It's not that desperate to yeah. want to have, want to have. Yeah. Not that kind of thing. Like there's some subtle. Would it be like genuine heart of sadness? Yeah, so. yeah. Um, that is the, the singular most amazing phrase that Trump Rinpoche released to us in this life. And it completely belongs to the human being. Beautiful. Thank you very much. There was something over here. Was that you? Would that be the suchness too? Perhaps, yes. Suchness and sacredness, yes. Yeah. Um, so I just I just wanted to comment on the the, the quote the um, <clears throat> how um, longing and hankering uh, nowhere else is clear seeing come I found that to be very um, <laughs> like disappointing and, <laughs> and like really kind of icky almost a little bit um, and it's it's like it's kind of unsettling 
<laughs> like, I, don't, I don't know what to say. Well, I want to comment and be like, really, is this the case? Um, Are you disappointed? Uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, it's like, I, I would much rather have since our uh, Nirvana be separate. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Oh, that's exactly. <laughs> it's much more fun that way. Yeah. Well, I'm, I, I, I don't, I don't know. Like maybe, maybe I'm hoping to ask for like solace or like what, or like how, how Because even though I'm like laughing about this and you know being a little jocular, it's very kind of um, agitating. Yeah, yeah, that's <laughs> agitating. Good. Please stay with it, and let's talk next week. <laughs> I mean, explore it. I mean, just because it's in a book or on the internet, we don't have to believe it. Yeah. Check it out. <laughs> I think I think it's true, though. <laughs> I see. Stay with it. I think it's really. A, I mean, I'm inviting this these phrases of Yoshe Sogyo so that you can read through them in the week. And just remind yourself of the teachings, because the whole reason I'm giving my, these talks like this is so that you have this song of realization you can read through and contemplate for the week. And this one is very potent, so they all are. But this one's very close to us because, in fact, we are human beings. So it relates very directly. They all relate because we have some seed of it, but this one in particular is a doorway to our liberation. So it's, I thank you so much for your vulnerability and your honesty and your willingness to go there with me. And please um, take care of yourselves. We are doing unraveling. Those of you that are in Karuna, we're doing Karuna work, aren't we? <laughs> we're doing contemplative psychology work, deep to the heart, it cuts very deep. And then we have to really take care of ourselves. We have to be responsible for ourselves. We have to eat well, sleep well, you know, not fill in the space that we're creating with habits. So please be thoughtful as you leave here tonight and for the week and come back. Is it next week that we have? Yeah. Okay, she, she's gonna announce. So thank you everybody. Have a beautiful night as well. Ah. I have okay, two announcements. One, just a reminder that next week we're not meeting on Tuesday night, we're meeting on Thursday night, the first of October. And the second thing is, is that I'm going to start, I'm going to bring the basket next week to begin collecting the teacher's gift. Um, she puts in so much into this class. And um, so, Contemplate over the next week or two if um, there's a way that you would like to express your gratitude for this teaching. So I'll just like, give you a heads up. Yes. Um, uh, Dean, I probably speak to this better, but coincidentally, um, the contemplative psychology program that Melissa pretty much started in Europe 20 years ago that was came out of Europa is happening. The introduction to that is happening next this coming weekend at Berkeley. I don't know if you want to say anything more about that. Yeah, it's just introduction to contemplative psychology, and it's a day and a half program. Um, again, the center, if you go to the Berkeley Shambhala website, you can find out more information about it. And we are offering scholarships. Um, it's 135 for the weekend, but um, for that, you need to like to attend and just let me know this information. So, 
uh, is it a workshop on how to administer psychology or is it a workshop of participating in that? It's going to be an exploration. I don't fully, I don't think it's about administering per se, but it is an intro to a longer, the longer career training for them to be used all the way to the it's designed for practitioners, but also if you're just interested as a lay person, you can get something out of it as well. Um, I think there's um, exercises, but I don't know what they're exactly going to be. And I think it's a exploration to you. Yeah. And I think the core practice in the program is body speech mind practice that you do in groups. I believe that's introduced at this weekend. So, and we end up doing that for the two years. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. There will be it'll probably help again in a few months. So. Yeah, if a couple um, people could stay to help rearrange the room.